Okay, good morning, everyone. So yesterday, I've given you some of the basic tools by which we analyze galaxy surveys to, to learn some fundamental cosmology. And I talked about the role that galaxy clustering played historically in establishing the standard model. Well, this school is supposed to be about looking forward in cosmology, so now we should talk about beyond the standard model. Um, what, is, what are we trying to do? What are we expecting or hoping to achieve over the next decade with, with galaxy surveys? I listed a few goals here. Um, number zero, not because I'm a C programmer, um, but neutrino mass is not exactly a goal, but it's almost a guaranteed development out of this field. So I'll say a few words about that. Most of the, these last two lectures, though, <coughs> will be about the main goals of large-scale structure, which are to do with the, the evolution of dark energy, or otherwise, that is, testing whether the vacuum energy is truly a cosmological constant, and also how we can use the peculiar velocity field associated with structure formation to test the theory of gravity. Um, a further interesting goal I don't have time for is, is to talk about how large-scale structure can be used to probe the Gaussian nature of the initial fluctuations, but I'll leave that aside. So let's say a few things about neutrinos quickly. I mean, it has to be admitted that neutrinos is one of the most impressive success stories in science of, of recent years, perhaps to me even more so than, than the achievements of LIGO. So putting together many different careful experiments um, underground detectors of, of atmospheric neutrinos and solar neutrinos gave us this, this nice picture of neutrino flavor oscillations from which we were able to say that the three different neutrino types differed in masses and we learned that the mass spectrum had two splittings in it, one relatively large characterized by a scale of about 0.05 electron volts and one significantly smaller. So there are two possible hierarchies that can satisfy those splittings. Um, there's either the, what's called the normal hierarchy, where the small splitting is at the bottom, and the, 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 the levels in mass become progressively more spaced as, as you go up. Or there's the inverted hierarchy, where the large splitting goes from some lower state and to a nearly degenerate upper state. Based on the oscillation experiments, we can't distinguish these. Um, we also don't know from oscillation experiments what the lowest energy eigenstate is. Um, it seems, certainly in, in, the, in the case of the, of the standard hierarchy, that it might be a good guess that it's zero or certainly negligibly small. Um, but we don't know for certain. So cosmology can settle both of these things. How does it do it? It does it by the impact of free streaming on the power spectrum. So what is free streaming? Free streaming is, means that at early times, every particle in the universe is ultra-relativistic. If it's energetic enough, it moves at the speed of light. And so, therefore, automatically, you erase any fluctuations. You can, you can perturb some collisionless particles all you like, but they're able to move out of the density peaks at the speed of light. And so those troughs will be erased up to the free streaming scale of CT. And then eventually, depending on the mass of the particle, the, um, the energy drops to the point where the particle is non-relativistic. So a useful formula for this is that the, uh, the free streaming scale in co-moving units, that is, measured today, um, is 80 megaparsecs for a, a particle mass of one electron volt and scales inversely with the, the particle mass. So that's why for cold dark matter, the, um, where, the, where the mass is, is, is presumed to be giga electron volts, this free streaming is, is completely irrelevant and the, and the power spectrum has no small scale damping. But in neutrinos, that's not the case. However, neutrinos, unless the mass is extremely large, order electron volts, are not the majority of the, of, the, of the dark matter, they're a minority constituent. So what happens is that on small scales, you might have perturbations in the cold dark matter 
and in the neutrinos. And the early times, they had the same. Then free streaming erases the perturbation in the neutrinos. So that means now that there's less gravity to cause the cold dark matter fluctuations to grow. So the, so the, so the rate at which the cold dark matter perturbations are amplified is now smaller. So there's a break in the power spectrum below the free streaming scale, which depends then on, on, on the mass of the neutrinos. Um, but for the sort of masses that are normally considered pretty well throughout the entire large scale structure range, all you're doing is, is just suppressing the amplitude a little bit. So the main constraint, the main way in which large scale structure is able to constrain the, the overall mass of, of the neutrino hierarchy, hello, is that my mother? Um, is, is by the overall amplitude of the, of the, um, the fluctuations. So, so effectively, if we knew sigma eight very accurately, we would be able to have some diagnostic of neutrinos. And so this really means that um, we need a probe that's sensitive to the overall amplitude of mass fluctuations. And that comes in the next lecture when I talk about um, richer space distortions. But just to show what the impact of, of the measuring neutrino mass would be, so here there's one free number which, which, which is relevant in cosmology, which is really the, the, the fraction of the dark matter that's in the form of neutrinos, because that determines the amount by which the, um, the growth is, is suppressed. So the sum over the neutrino masses, the lowest value that can possibly take is, um, is, is about 0.06 electron volts. And that would be in the case of the normal hierarchy, where you set the, the lowest mass eigenstate to zero. If you rise above that, that minimum 0.06 electron volts, this graph shows how the three masses of the individual eigenstates must change in order to, to maintain the, the known pattern of splittings. So red is the standard hierarchy, blue is the inverted hierarchy, and you can barely see the two mass states up here. So you see for the inverted hierarchy, it's not possible to get a, a sum of the masses below a tenth of an electron volt. So if, if you can determine from cosmology by suppression of small scale power that, that the mass has to be below there, you've determined which hierarchy we live in. And the current limits from Planck are getting pretty close to that. They quote an upper limit of 0.12 electron volts. So you can see it's not going to take much in the way of additional data. I should say this. this doesn't come directly from the CMB. As I emphasized, you need a measurement, a direct measurement of the local sigma eight. So either from gravitational lensing or from richer space distortions. But you combine that with the, the microwave background to, to pull in degeneracies with other parameters. Um, so that's the meaning of the plus plus here, the CMB plus external data. So you see there's every reason to expect that when the next generation of large scale structure experiments reports, this limit will shrink to the point where probably we'll be focusing on the standard hierarchy. So that's what I mean when I say neutrinos are a guaranteed win. At least this is something we can definitely expect to see happen soon. All right, so now let's turn to things that are more speculative, particularly the question of what the dark energy is or at least not what it is, but how it behaves. So the question we would like to answer is whether the vacuum energy is, is a complete cosmological constant that is totally unevolving, or whether it changes with time. Now, as you know, there are fundamental problems associated with a cosmological constant at the observed small level. So many people would be happy to think that this small level had been reached by evolution, that is, that the vacuum energy was much larger in the past and was somehow falling towards zero. But we have to see if we can measure that evolution. And as, as we'll see, the way of, of achieving that is by geometrical means, by looking at the expansion history of the universe. And the great tool that Starsky Structure gives us are the, the barren acoustic oscillations. So I want to give you this, this story now. And these acoustic oscillations are very familiar outside large scale structure because they dictate the, 
the appearance of the, of the CMB sky to a large extent. So we've seen the power spectrum of the, of the CMB. Actually, Dimitri, did you show, I don't, did you actually show a real picture or just a sketch? Yeah, just artist impression, good. Um, so this, this is more or less the real thing. So here's the, the Sachs-Wolf plateau where we're looking at gravitational potential fluctuations. But these acoustic peaks um, going up, uh, we've lost the scale, but this is an angular multipole of about 220 where the spectrum peaks, which means these little red dots of about one degree, these patches. What, what are we seeing here? This is the scale of, of the acoustic oscillations. That is, you know, on small scales, you're looking just at denser plasma, where compressing the plasma adiabatically has heated it. Um, but at small scales, the amplitude of the density fluctuations are cut off in, in a way that I will explain. Um, and they're cut off at a causal scale, that is the scale that is the maximal scale that sound waves in the early universe can propagate to. So let's emphasize that um, a lot of this phenomenology can be understood in the limit of what's called tight coupling which means that Thomson scattering implies that, that photons and electrons are a single fluid. Um, and that fluid is just characterized by some speed of sound. And for a lot of the time, that's roughly C on route three. <coughs> it only falls at, the, at late times as the universe cools. So for a long time, you have a radiation-dominated single fluid. Um, and you can therefore ask, what's the co-moving distance that, um, that sound waves propagating at that speed can reach? And so you're trying to integrate the speed of sound dt divided by a, and the scale factor to put it into co-moving units. And this scale comes out to be about 150 megaparsecs. And we're observing it in the CMB at about 13 gigaparsecs distance, which is what gives you the one degree scale. So here's a beautiful graph that, um, that gives some more insight into, into how this, um, this pattern arises. Although it's also, I should say, misleading, but I'll, I'll explain why it's misleading in a minute. Let's just start off and consider that we make a spike uh, perturbation just located at, at, at one place in all the matter constituents, dark matter, including photons and neutrinos. And then we just let it, let it go. Oh, come on. Ah. Uh. Frustrating, I've lost my, hang on. Sorry, this, uh, I lost, I need to show this in, in slow motion, just for a minute. I wish I could make this bigger, never mind, this will do. All right, so this is at a redshift of, uh, of what, two, two and a half thousand. Um, and so what, what, you, what you see is the neutrinos, which are streaming away at the speed of light. You see the gas and the photons as a single couple fluid going at C on route three, and the dark matter, of course, should go at a much lower rate, but partly it's dragged out by the gravity of these, these other constituents. And as this proceeds, what you'll see is decoupling where the um, where Thompson scattering fails to be effective and the gas and the photons separate. There, okay. All right, so now the photons 
are starting to get away from the gas. Uh, we've, we're down at a rate of around 1,000. So at this point, the, the, the mean free path for scattering is becoming effectively infinite. And so now the photons can move at the speed of light to try to catch up with the neutrinos, and they leave the baryonic component stranded. Okay, and at this point, um, the universe has now become matter dominated. So, uh, what's able to happen is that dark matter and the baryons are able to fall together. So you'll see some hump in the in the baryons in the dark matter being created at this acoustic scale. So the baryons suck the dark matter in and and reduce their own amplitudes. They fall together, and even at redshift. 10. See, they're not expected to be quite um, having, the, the, having the, the, the same spatial distribution. Okay, so why do I say this is misleading? The reason this is misleading is that what, what you're being shown here is a Green's function. That is, you take the, the radial distribution that's, that comes out of this calculation and you use it to convolve whatever fluctuations exist. And the danger with this picture is it gives people the impression that large-scale structure in the universe on the, uh, the acoustic scale of 150 megaparsecs arises by this kind of causal process, which of course it doesn't. Fluctuations in the universe on these wavelengths always existed and they were created, and the great mystery of cosmology is they exist from early times and therefore had to be created in an acausal way. So this picture leads you to, to, to forget that we actually need inflation or something like it to generate pre-existing fluctuations on these scales. But their properties become modified by these kind of sound propagation effects. Um, I should just emphasize, by the way, that Sometimes it's confusing in the literature when people talk about the acoustic scale because there are actually two acoustic scales. Um, one is the one that's relevant for the CMB, where we're talking about a, a redshift of just under 1100. And there, um, the standard acoustic horizon is about 145 megaparsecs. It depends on the, on the matter density and on the baryon density, but these are fiducial values. On the other hand, um, there is still some degree of coupling between photons and, and, and baryons at, at, at last scattering. And so the acoustic horizon continues to grow afterwards, and it's not really completely decoupled until a redshift of um, just over a thousand. It's called the, the drag redshift in the literature. So by that point, the, um, the acoustic scale has, has grown to about uh, just over 150 megaparsecs. Um, so you, know, you might not think that 145 to 150 is much to get worried about, but these days cosmology is very precise, so it's important to distinguish these numbers. All right, let's look at this in, in terms of transfer functions, um, where I'll, I'm just showing separately the transfer functions for the, the baryon photon component and the cold out matter component. Now, Dimitri, I don't think, gave this. Um, this relation, but in the, radi in the radiation era, where the speed of sound is, is just C on root 3, you can derive analytically the, the transfer function for the, the, for the, uh, the, the, the photon baron component. And, and here's the expression. It's basically something like resembling a sync function. Um, and it's just a function of k scaled by um, the speed of sound times eta, the, the conformal time. And so here it is. These are the, the oscillations that, that come from these trig functions. And at that time, what does the transfer function the cold out matter look like? It's of this smooth nature here. It's probably just worth trying to, to emphasize why that is. Um, at early times, when fluctuations are outside the horizon, in the radiation era, the amplitude of density fluctuations will just grow universally 
as the, as the square of the scale factor. So when they enter the horizon, pressure effects on the, 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 the photon baryon fluid will prevent any further growth. And, and what that means is that the, because the, 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 this is the dominant constituent of the universe at that time, so if you reduce the growth of the photon baryon fluid, there's less gravity, gravitational attraction available to cause the dark matter fluctuations to grow. So the effect then is, is that the growth of dark matter, which is previously following the pressure-free growth, switches off and, and keeps the same amplitude until the universe becomes matter-dominated, and then the fluctuations can grow at the standard um, rate proportional to the scale factor. So this is the thing called the Metzaros effect. Yes, indeed. Or, or actually, a, a better way of talking about this evolution is in terms of, of, of potential, because we know there the growing mode is just constant potential. And then when you enter the horizon, you're starting to damp the fluctuations away. And in, in, the, case of, um, in, in the case of the baryon photon component, you damp them away in an oscillatory fashion. And because you've reduced the, um, the gravitational potential, that driving term for the growth of, of dark matter reduces the amplitude of dark matter fluctuations. And all this continues until matter radiation equality, when the potential can then become constant again. OK, so. So the dark matter transfer function is dictated by the length of time the given mode spends between entering the horizon and, and the time of matter radiation equality. So there's a key wavelength, therefore, where the mode only enters the horizon just at matter radiation equality. Oops. And, and, that's, uh, and that's what dictates the point at which the, the pure dark matter transfer function first bends away from, from unity. And it's a length. Of course, it's dictated by the length, which is the horizon size at matter radiation equality, which is 16 megaparsecs with a scaling inversely with, with omega h. And so this is what we saw in the last lecture of, of why um, measuring the curvature in the matter power spectrum is able to give us the density parameter. But going back to, to the BAO scale, so now at Recombination, more or less, we have this smooth transfer function in the, in the dark matter, this highly oscillatory transfer function in the radiation and baryons, and then the two move together. And so the baryons become less perturbed, the CDM becomes more perturbed, and eventually they settle down to the point where the dark matter, where the overall mass transfer function has weak wiggles in it with an amplitude of about 20%. And that reflects the fact that the baryon constituent of the universe is about 20%. Okay, so that's where the baryon scale comes from, and this is what it actually looks like. Um, so here I'm showing the, the two-point correlation function as, as, as measured with uh, luminous red galaxies in SDSS, and I'm showing it in a form that we'll see a lot more of next lecture, and it act this actually already exhibits register space distortions. And let me just explain now. What we have here. You have you. You're observing some pair of galaxies with a separation R, and I'm dissecting that separation into a line of sight component, often called sigma, and a transverse component, sometimes called pi or rp. Uh, okay, and it's pi in this case. So this is line of sight separations, this is transverse separations. 
And what we see is a, a ring at the BAO scale. It's a really, really beautiful picture. And what this emphasizes is that you can measure the BAO scale in two distinct ways. You can measure it transversely, or you can measure it radially. And these give you two distinct things. Because in the transverse scale, what you're really measuring is an angle. So what this is going to tell you is the angular diameter distance at, at, at the redshift you're looking to. If you're looking radially, um, you're measuring a, a change in redshift, observationally, which means you're sensitive to the, the Hubble parameter. Just, just to be explicit, the, um, the change in co-moving distance is just um, C Z on H of Z. Hmm? So that's why in the radial extent, you're able to measure directly the Hubble parameter at, at the redshift you're looking to. And if you want the, um, the distance, the co-moving angular diameter distance, and you just have to integrate this, C, D, Z, or H. All right, well, this is what it looks like. Um, and this, this beautiful slide from, from the BOSS publications give you the result either as the two-point function, or well, it's, it's two-point function squared by, multiplied by distance squared to tilt things to, to make the peak more visible. And it's really exquisite how, how clear this is and how well it, it matches the theory. Uh, and in Fourier space, you see it, of course, as a series of harmonics. If it's a confined thing in, in real space, in Fourier space, it must be, must be spread out. So either of these show you that this acoustic scale has been measured very precisely. And the precision to the mean redshift of the BOSS sample, which is just under 0.6, is about 1%. I'll say that again, 1%. You know, to be able to measure distances on cosmological scales to that level of precision is extraordinary. You know, when I started out in the subject, if you told me that you, we'd be able to do this, I think nobody would have believed you. So we should celebrate this, this great achievement. What this gives you, then, is, is the ability to, to plot out the, uh, the distance as a function of redshift. Um, and what you'll often see is a thing that's um, it's called dv, and it's a weighting of the angular diameter distance squared, actually, times an effective distance produced from the, from the radial component, CZ on, on H, um, all to the one-third. Um, and here, with error bars so small you can barely see them, um, is, the, is, the, is the blank distance, is the, is the boss distance. Now, look closely here, you'll see there's an R over R term. What, what is that? That's saying that you, only, you get an absolute distance, provided you're prepared to say that you know in a, the absolute value of the, of the acoustic scale. So that is, you have to buy into the, the full CDM model, which you could choose not to do. You could say that the, the acoustic scale that we see uh, and, and the, the BAO signature from, from galaxy clustering is an empirical length scale. You don't have to ask physically where it comes from. Um, but then you'd lose the absolute calibration of these distances. Uh, just to point out that this signature has been seen over a range of redshifts, um, going from down about 0.1 to, to actually a bit beyond one now. And what I've got here is a standard CDM prediction for the distance redshift relation. And the, the great thing about this is that this is derived from the parameters fitted to Planck. 
without any adjustment. So the PEO distances are completely consistent with the standard model. That's an absolute triumph. But the fact that these agree so well, therefore, limits non-standard models. Um, I should just say as well that the, uh, the BO signal has been seen not only in the galaxy distribution, but in, in the gas distribution. So, um, <coughs> the, the STSS also has provided a, a sample of around about 100,000 quasars. So, for that, um, you, you're able to, uh, to look at the Lyman Alpha forest. So, The world of cosmology has changed a lot, you know, but the, the world of popular culture has, has, has changed as well. When, 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 I, when I was young, often you turned on the television, you'd see a magician, and the trick they would do is they would put a lady inside a box and then put swords through holes in the box, um, and then somehow the lady would emerge unscathed. Have you ever seen this trick? So we do the same thing with quasars. Right? So you you have a a set of the high ridge of quasars, and each of those gives us a line of sight through, through the general evolving gaseous distribution here. So each, each quasar spectrum, the flux versus frequency, you know, has, has dips in it, for, and e each of these are... Uh, Lyman alpha absorption from intervening hydrogen. So these are a measure of the large scale structure along a, a line of sight. And if you have enough spectra, then of course you can do cross correlations between the densities in, in adjacent lines. You, you can't, you're not allowed to, to learn about the density in between the lines of sight, but given a sufficiently dense grid, this is a very effective way of probing the mass distribution without using discrete galaxies as traces. Um, and once more, we see the, um, the, the BEO peak. So that, that gives us uh, this, this very nice plot where you're able to distinguish these three distance traces, um, either um, the angular diameter distance, which is the red one, or the, um, the line of sight distance from the Hubble parameter, which is the, the green one, or this um, volume weighted intermediate case here. So there's really only two. Um, and the Lyman alpha results up at um, that redshift beyond two don't agree with the fiducial model perhaps quite as well as the as the uh, as the galaxy results at the redshift point six, but it's still pretty impressive how how well separated these measures are and how close to the to the prediction. So the data set of this is, is, is really pretty good. <clears throat> it's worth asking how well this, this agrees with the competing means by which you can do geometrical cosmology by, that is, measure the distance redshift relation. And of course, the first person to do this was with, with a type 1a supernovae. Um, so here's the, here's the low redshift um, supernova Hubble diagram just going out to Richard point two, emphasizing how beautifully linear the data are. Um, so if you extend that to, to beyond redshift one and ratio to the distance, the fiducial distance redshift relation, here's the individual supernovae, here are the points binned. So here's the equivalent diagram, um, measured distance divided by fiducial for BEO. So who wins? Um, well, BEO win in terms of redshift coverage, um, getting out well beyond redshift one, whereas the supernovae, there's, well, actually, it's, it's more or less a tie. The highest redshift supernova is just over two. Um, but there's only just one object. So in terms of precision, at around about redshift one to two, BEO are doing better, and will certainly do much better with next generation surveys. So what about precision? Um, slightly different, different things plotted here. 
So this is a difference in distance modulus. What on earth is that? That's, that's effectively a difference in magnitudes. So you can think of this as pretty well the fractional difference in distance squared. So therefore, 0.05 magnitudes corresponds to 2.5% offset in distance. And that would be about here. So if you concentrate on, say, redshift 0.5, where the most accurate BOSS measurements are, the BEO results of 1% precision are a little bit better than the supernovae. Not hugely better, but um, I think in terms of overall constraining power, BEO is, is slightly better. But the impressive thing, again, is that they agree so well. All right. Um, another distinction between these two geometrical probes is in terms of robustness. Um, historically, as I tried to emphasize y y yesterday, the supernovae have a, have a great um, PR department. They would convince you that they were the, the only way that we first discovered that dark energy existed. But honestly, supernovae are, are complicated astrophysical objects. There's every reason to worry as to whether, whether you have a consistent set of, of standard candles going from red, local redshifts right out to redshift two. And I think if, if supernovae were the only means we had of tracing the distance redshift relation, many people would rightly be skeptical as, as to whether we, we, we had the correct answer. But for the reasons I'll, I'll try and explain now, the BAO ruler is, is, is much more robust. The main way in which the BEO result can be affected is by nonlinear evolution. So let's talk about this a little bit. Um, and I'll show you this again, both in Fourier and in configuration space. So here is the power spectrum divided by um, a smooth power spectrum that doesn't, con so pure CDM that doesn't contain the, the baryon oscillations. So at high redshift, you see linear theory. There's the the, um, the, the BO harmonics. Um, as you go to lower redshift, nonlinear evolution on small scales becomes more important, and you'll see that it actually damps away the visibility of the oscillations. So the, the harmonic around 0.2 is only weakly visible at redshift 0.3. If you put that in configuration space, what you see is it looks a bit like a, um, a convolution. So here is linear theory for for the, um, the BAO peak. And what you actually see in the simulation is, is something of much weaker visibility. So you can understand that actually rather simply by, by a very nice model that Eisenstein et al. introduced back in 2007. And this is all to do with uh, the cosmological displacement field. So I mentioned several times yesterday at least in linear theory, you can say the density fluctuation is minus the divergence of, of a displacement. So if you want to write that in, in, in Fourier space, you can say that the displacement, it goes, well, for the growing mode, the displacement goes parallel to the wave vector. This makes a lot of sense, whereas I have a, a mode running in a given direction. So high density, low, high density, low, high. Well, the only way to produce those corrugations of density is for matter to fall onto the high density regions. So the velocities are in this direction parallel to, to K. <coughs> and since in Fourier space, um, you replace the del operator by minus i times k. You can see immediately that you can just write d as, del as the density disturbance divided by the wave vector is their amplitude. So you can figure out the, um, the RMS distance over which matter particles have moved. 
It's just putting that one over k squared weighting into the integral over the whole power spectrum. And now, if you think about a pair of galaxies separated by 150 megaparsecs, each of these has a D. And there's sufficiently large separations, these can be treated to be uncorrelated. So if you, uh, if you take, you divide by root three to get the one dimensional dispersion, and then multiply by root two to get the relative dispersion of a pair, you would come up with the conclusion that you're perturbing the ends of your, of your 150 megaparsec ruler by about eight megaparsecs. So you're just convolving this 150 ruler by something, a Gaussian about eight megaparsecs wide. And there's another line on here that does that, that on, with this projector you can't distinguish from the n-body data. So we have a good understanding of the impact of nonlinear evolution on, on the BAO scale. And that's actually led to people who work on this to be able to do something very clever, um, which is to try to undo that convolution. So let me, let me show this, this, this picture from Nikhil Padmanaban. Suppose you take some point in space, go away 150 megaparsecs to the acoustic length, and so you've got a, a pile of galaxies that are all correlated with the central point. That's in linear theory. You now allow that matter distribution to evolve. Where do all these points move to? They move to this, this distorted ring. These distortions are a result of the, of the cosmic displacement field. Um, <clears throat> but you can use the, the observed matter distribution itself to predict what the, what the velocity field will be and guess what the displacements were and therefore try and move these particles back onto the ring. So how does, how does this reconstruction work? Um, works like, like this. Um, the displacement field you can write as minus the gradient of some potential. Right? And this is um, uh, growing mode of density fluctuations is has no vorticity, so it's potential flow. So if I want density field, you just have a form of Poisson's equation. So if, if, you, if you know the density fluctuation, you can solve Poisson's equation to find the potential. And from the potential, you can take the gradient to find the displacement. So it's, it's straightforward to do this. You, you can do this on large scales, just um, say solving, uh, put the density field on, on, a, on a mesh, solve Poisson's equation using Fourier transforms. <clears throat> and therefore you can undo, you can infer how much galaxies have moved um, and therefore undo those large scale displacements. In practice, the, the way people do this is, 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 is slightly subtle. Um, that's, 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 that's explained on this, on this slide here. Um, actually, time is, time is running out, but let's, let me just skip over that. Here's, here's the result. Um, this is the, the raw BO peak with the convolution in, as you would measure from the data, uncorrected data, if you just apply this reconstruction of the displacement, you move the particles in the BO ring back to where they should have been and recover the full amplitude. So that's the meaning of when we looked at the BO data earlier on, when it says post recon, that that reconstruction algorithm has been applied to sharpen up the, the, the peak, and it wouldn't have been so impressive otherwise.
Okay, so just to finish, so there was a question. Yeah. You ask, why has the reconstruction been done in configuration space? Um, well, well, the reconstruction is done in configuration space because that's where the galaxies are. I mean, the, the displacement field moves the galaxies, so you want to move them back to something nearer their linear theory positions. Okay, and having done that, then you can analyze that new space, that changed spatial distribution with either Fourier or or configuration space statistics. It doesn't matter. Either way, you'll, you'll have an improved signal to noise for the BAO signal. Yeah, no, that, no, that, that, that's, that's right. I mean, the, the, the question was, is, oops, is there any deconvolution going on? Um, I mean, obviously, if you have a sufficiently high signal-to-noise measurement of this convolved function, and you know that the broadening is by blurring with an 8 megaparsec Gaussian, then yes, you could apply a deconvolution algorithm and recover this shape. But that wouldn't give you any improved signal-to-noise in the location of the peak. Right? It would change the. It would give you a noisier, sharpened peak. I mean, that's what deconvolution does, it amplifies the noise. What we're trying to do is, is to reduce the noise, remove it. And this, this, this method of recovering the, the, um, the displacement field allows you to do that. All right, so a few words then about what use this is for dark energy. As I, I showed you how well the, the standard distance redshift relation agrees. With, with the BAO data. So what about a non-standard distance redshift relation? Well, we've had this before. Um, D equals integral C dz on H. So H becomes H naught with these factors. So, so there's the, um, let's work backwards, there's the evolving matter density changing as the, uh, the cube of the scale factor. There's a curvature term, which um, you could neglect. You might decide, I just want to do this for, for flat universes. Um, but this is one minus the total omega. And that changes in, in, in the, the Friedman equation as with the square of the scale factor. And then there's the, um, the dark energy term. So I don't know if has anybody in any lectures so far defined W? Yeah, you, you all know what W is, I hope. It's, um, I'll write it anyway. It's the pressure divided by the, um, the energy density. So for example, um, radiation Pressure is one third of the energy density for a relativistic fluid, and that's where the C on root three speed of sound comes from. So, given that equation of state, the density of some substance would change as the scale factor to the minus three into one plus W. Of course, for a cosmological constant, the density is invariant, but otherwise it, it evolves. So you want to put that evolution in the Friedman equation and see what happens. So you can ask, therefore, how does the distance respond to changes in that W parameter? And the answer is a, a rule of thumb involving a factor five. That is, if you want to know the, 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 the the change, the fractional change in the distance is five times smaller than the change in W. So for example, if you want to know W to 5% precision, you need to measure distances to 1%. But of course, there are other parameters in here. Um, so there's a similar sort of level, the sensitivity to changes in the, in the matter density. 
and actually a much larger sensitivity to changes in, in curvature. So you, have, you want to be sure that the universe is flat, and even then, you want to be able to pin down the matter density parameter to below 1% precision um, to, to give yourself a chance of measuring deviations of the equation of state from minus one that are of, of, of the order of a, of a few percent. So it's pretty challenging, and um, therefore we should be impressed with, with, with how far we, we've, we've come. By, by the way, so this, this plot is, is really just showing these derivatives as a function of redshift. Um, so the, the black line, the solid lines, there's three different colors on here, but they hardly shows on that projector. <laughs> okay, well, believe it or not, this line is blue and this line is red. Um, right, so this is, this is the impact of a change in W on, on, on distance. So you see it's uh, eight, five, four, three. So it's maximum um, yes, so it, it's a maximum point two, which is the origin of this of this factor five at a redshift one, and the sensitivity is, is less obviously at lower redshift and also slightly less at higher redshift. Um, the dashed line shows the sensitivity to the, the density parameter. So this is, the fact these curves don't have the same shape is good if you have data over a number of redshifts. I also show on here um, the impact on the Hubble parameter of changing W and changing the density parameter, and indeed of the, um, of the growth rate of density fluctuations. So all these things are pulled around by of order 10 or 20 percent if you uh, by, by changes in, in w so there's a possibility of, of pinning down the evolution of dark energy if you can measure these these functions accurately as as we have so here's the the, the bottom line well actually it's not the bottom line it's the uh, it's the Planck 2015 bottom line but you know if you look at Planck 2018 it's almost unchanged except their color scheme is much more ugly so i didn't change the slide um, this actually shows you a two-dimensional dark energy empirical model where the, the guess is that if the uh, equation of state is, isn't just a constant, it might change linearly with the scale factor. So it takes some value today and W0 plus WA at, at, at high redshift. Um, unsurprisingly, our ability to constrain the evolution in the equation of state is pretty poor. Um, so it mostly makes more sense to say, focus on the case of an unevolving equation of state. That is, you presume that WA is zero, you just take a cut along here. And then what you see is that um, CMB data alone have very little constraining power. And that's because the CMB is only involving the distance, the one distance measure, the one, the one to last scattering. And you get additional leverage on, on W if you're able to measure intermediate distances, which is what the BAO method does. So once you take Planck and you add in distance scale, so BAO, JLA is joint light curve analysis, which means just a particular supernova sample, um, then that sharpens things up. And so if you ask how wide is this ellipse here, it basically has an RMS in W of about five or six percent. So at that level, which we could have guessed, bearing in mind I said that we'd measured the distance from the VAO scale to about 1%, and this factor 5 sensitivity in, in the change of distances with W, we should be happy that we, we ought to be able to measure W to, to about 5% precision. Um, and at the moment, it looks completely consistent with the cosmological constant. So the question will be for future generations of experiment, whether we can push these error bars down to the 1% level, and if so, whether it's still consistent with minus one. And that's all I wanted to say, and there are 27 seconds left. Thank you. Questions, coffee?
Okay, the question was type, um, the, the point of decoupling of, of matter and radiation it depends on the strength of the Thomson scattering. The Thomson cross section itself depends on fundamental constants. So, do the fundamental constants change? Well, that's, it's, it's certainly possible that they do. Um, although, you, 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 you've got to be careful. Um, this, there is quite a big literature in, in non-standard model cosmology on, on evolving fundamental constants. But what, what, what does it mean if, to say, for example, um, suppose you wanted the speed of light to change with time. How, how could you actually measure that? Because any measuring rod that we have is also related to fundamental constants in, in some way. So what it means is you have to look for dimensionless combinations. So you have something like the fine structure constant. Um, uh, so you can certainly ask whether the fine structure constant changes with time. Um, and people have, have, have tried to do this just, just by, uh, by looking at, you know, actually quasar spectroscopy gives you a, a means of, of probing this, looking at sort of fine structure lines and, and high redshift objects. If it changes, um, is that a change in C, in H cross, or in E? You can't possibly tell. So you can only ask whether the dimensionless constants that enter change. Now, Thompson cross-section isn't a dimensionless quantity, so you would have to ask whether there could be evolution in the, cross, in the Thompson cross-section relative to some other length, and you'd have to decide what that was. Anyway, the, the, the point is that potential evolution of the fundamental constants is, is very much something that, that people discuss in um, uh, you know, any, any more general model, there are a variety of scalar fields out there. Often these scalar fields couple to the values of the, of the, of the fundamental constants. So there's plenty of scope for wondering if they, if they evolve, but that evolution is not, um, is not discussed in any, any of this stuff. It's complicated enough without it. Okay, I think we're done for now.